Um, so thank you, uh, thank you to uh, Professor Campisi first, and of course thank you to all the participants uh, for attending the talk. Uh, just a few words before, but very briefly before um, before we we um, we start. Uh, so Julie Campisi is a professor of biogerontology, and she works at the Buck Institute in California. So you can see uh, that on the screen, actually, on uh, Judy's slide. Um, she's also a member of the National Academy of Science and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And um, very so, of course, it could take a very long time to present uh, her career, uh, given the many achievements uh, she's uh, had. Um, I would just like to focus on something which is uh, the topic of uh, her talk, and uh, and also, and that's good for me uh, because uh, it's also my main interest um, in uh, in research. So uh, I will listen to that very. Um, with uh, great attention. So her name is actually associated with uh, a major recognition uh, in two fields. Uh, that is the recognition of a, of, a, of a strong link between cancer and aging. So that's of course something that has been discussed for years, but at a, at a very theoretical level. And uh, what uh, Judy has uh, uh, done actually is um, pushed the idea that there was uh, a very strong relation between the two through uh, actually uh, the, uh, the role of senescent cells. So that's of course much more complicated than that, but she, uh, her name is associated with that idea. And, uh, and this idea in turn has played a, a huge um, role actually, a very important role in the field of uh, what is now called zero science. Uh, that is um, the agenda uh, that or that proposes that to treat age-related diseases, it's uh, useful or can be important to target some of the pathways of aging. And uh, uh, the main uh, line of research, uh, let's say nowadays, is uh, synolytics. And I, and I know that she will also uh, mention synolytics. And this, uh, this uh, area of research is very uh, rooted in her own work, and her own uh, early work, and uh, work she has gone on and, and pursued and, um, and deepened with, uh, with the years. OK, uh, so with that, uh, I just wanted also to emphasize that what she has proposed is not a general and vague conceptual framework, uh, as is sometimes the case with uh, some of the proponents of uh, the zero science uh, agenda. Uh, but she has proposed a real hypothesis, one that is probably testable and one that is also that has also been uh, or gathered some recognition in uh, in evolutionary biology as well uh, as a, um, a bona fide example of antagonistic pleiotropy. So uh, I won't say uh, much more because I, I guess uh, Judy will say it much better than I can do. And um, so uh, the floor is yours, Judy, and uh, we will have the round of questions after that. Um, so if you have already for the participants, if you want to ask questions in the, in the chat during the talk, it's also possible. Uh, and Judy can do uh, as she likes, that is answer them during the talk or after the talk. Uh, both work, of course. Uh, so thank you again, Judy, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. This is actually a treat for me. This is not my usual audience. So I, I'm really pleased. And actually, if, if you want to just interrupt me and ask me a question outright, I, I, I don't mind. I don't. I think this would be much more fun if it were give and take. So, uh, you know, I, I have this title, Cancer and Aging, Rival Demons. Um, I'll explain to you why we think they're rival demons. Um, this is just a disclaimer about a company that I'm involved with. I, I will not be talking about them at all, but I will start <clears throat> with aging. So you all know, nobody dies of good health. We all die of diseases. And the sad thing is, even though a disease might not kill us, for example, macular degeneration or hearing loss, the quality of life tends to decline dramatically in the last decade or so of most of human life now, if, if you manage to live that long. And these diseases are 
really different, very different tissues, very different manifestations of what goes wrong in the tissue. And yet all of them have something in common. And what they have in common is that all of these diseases are extremely rare in young people and somewhere around the midpoint of the lifespan. So for us humans, maybe 50 to 60 years of age, all of these diseases begin to rise with approximately exponential kinetics. Now, those of us who work on aging believe this is not a coincidence, that there must be some basic aging processes that are driving all of these diseases that are capable of affecting so many different tissues in so many different ways. <clears throat> So what I will tell you today is about the rising body of evidence that suggests we have identified one such basic aging process. It's a process called cellular senescence. I'll tell you a lot more about that in a moment, but I don't want to leave you with the impression that we, well, especially me, um, believe that this is the only thing that's driving aging. There's still a lot more work to be done. But we think that by identifying one of these processes, we have a hope of maybe at least alleviating some of the disabilities that are associated with late life. So how did it happen that this process of cellular senescence, which is a single cell fate, how did this get identified as an aging process? And let's go back to this, um, panoply of partial list of the age-related diseases. What you will notice is that all of these diseases, well, most of these diseases are degenerative in nature. And what that means is the cells within the tissue either fail to function or the tissue itself fails to function. So it's a loss of function um, phenomenon that then ends up driving a disease, a pathology. And then there's this disease, cancer. So I personally would be very hard pressed to call cancer a degenerative disease. If you think about what a cancer cell needs to do in order to form a lethal tumor, that cell has to acquire new functions, new ways of growing and surviving in an environment in which normally it would not. And so it now then begs the question of whether these loss of function diseases have something in common with this gain of function disease. And I will point out cancer is just like all the other diseases, very rare in young people, exponential rise at about the midpoint of the lifespan. So this is then the way we kind of rephrase the question we asked, could we find a common biology that links cancer and degenerative diseases and might help explain aging? And so the way we did that is we took advantage of the fact that for many decades, probably even still, the field of cancer research was much more sophisticated and much more um, ahead of the field of aging research. So a lot more was known about cancer than was known about aging when we started this quest, which was maybe 20 years ago. So cancer biologists have asked the question, what causes cancer? What are the root causes of cancer? And they had uh, two main answers, which is an oversimplification, but are nonetheless completely true. And the first is mutation. So you know this, right? There is not a single cancer cell that I know of or any oncologist knows of that does not harbor mutations. And by mutations, I don't mean those rare mutations that are germline mutations. These are mutations that we acquire as adults. And sometimes we acquire them quite early in life, but they are somatic mutations that begin to arise at some point after we're born and accumulate throughout most of our life. So here's the problem. 
probably it was maybe in the 1970s that Doug Brash was the first to show that if you took skin biopsies from very young people and compared them to skin biopsies from old people and looked for a common type of cancer causing mutation, um, they begin to accumulate quite early. So the mutations that we know are potentially oncogenic, have the potential to drive a cell into a neoplastic phenotype. They can be apparent even in very young tissues, long before disease. So along comes another uh, giant in the field, <clears throat> a woman named Mina Bissell. She actually recruited me to Berkeley, for which I'm eternally grateful. Um, and she was a pioneer in the field that argued mutations weren't enough. What you also needed was a tissue environment that was permissive for those mutant cells to express their mutation phenotype. And so here's an example from one of her classic papers. So what you're looking at are human breast epithelial cells growing in a three-dimensional culture and the red are nuclei, <clears throat> and the green is a protein called ecadherin. And what ecadherin does is it organizes those cells into alveoli. And if you section through these um, cultures, you would see alveoli that look very much like what you would see if you section through a human breast. The middle panel is a breast cancer. And I mean, you can see it, it, it's a mess, right? Nuclei are lobulated, <clears throat> ecadherin is all over the place. The cells are not organized. They're invading into the matrix. Um, this particular uh, breast cancer had a mutation in an integrin protein, a cell surface protein that's important for communicating with the extracellular environment. And what Mina did in this case is she treated this particular cancer with an anti integrin antibody that neutralized that mutant integrin. And this is what she got. So this does not, of course, work for all cancers because not all cancers have mutations and in integrins, but it was an example of how you could take a malignant cell and trick it into behaving more normally by tricking it into thinking it was in a different tissue environment. And that of course gave rise to the idea that in order to form a tumor, you need two things. You need mutations, but you also need a permissive tissue environment. So this is biology. Um, I don't know <clears throat> what many of your background is, but I was trained in biophysics where there are lots of real hard, fast rules. This is not true for biology. There's always a but. And so here's the but. Anyone who's looked in the mirror recently and is over 30, <laughs> you know that tissue structure also begins to change quite early in life, long before clinical disease. And of course, you can you could always if you would have blinded, take a tissue from a 15 year old and a 50 year old, give it to a pathologist blinded, <clears throat> the pathologist would very much be able to tell you which tissue is young and which is old. So tissue structure begins to degrade quite early in life. And so that begs the question then, why does it take five to six decades before we see this exponential rise in cancer? And the answer, of course, had to do with evolutionary biology. If you think about what evolution had to do, so just to remind you, throughout 99% of our um, evolutionary history, there was no aging. There was no cancer. There was no Alzheimer's disease, no macular degeneration, no osteoarthritis. There was no aging. Organisms died young. And they died young, usually of infection or starvation or predation. And therefore evolution had to put in place um, mechanisms to prevent those early mutations from developing into a cancer in order to keep young organisms fit and able to have their babies and propagate 
um, the species. And so, of course, evolution did a great job. And it has, in fact, given us probably, I don't know, dozens of genes that we collect collectively call tumor suppressor genes. And these genes evolved for the purpose of suppressing the development of cancer. And it does a very good job because as you all know, most of our, half of our lifespan, we are protected from the development of cancer and many other diseases. So now I'm going to argue that that remarkable protection against the development of cancer came at a cost. And that cost is what we recognize as aging. So here is how the argument goes. <clears throat> Many years ago, three, probably three decades ago, two very famous cancer biologists, Kinsler and Vogelstein, proposed that we should think of tumor suppression as coming in two main flavors. They call them caretakers and gatekeepers. So caretakers are pretty easy to understand. These are tumor suppressor genes that code for proteins that take care of our genome. So these are our major antioxidant defense proteins. These are DNA repair proteins. And these can even be considered longevity assurance genes because they help assure our longevity by taking care of our genome. But there was this other class of tumor suppressors, they called gatekeepers. They're much more complicated. These are proteins that are sensors of cell state. And they send cell state by numerous signaling pathways that impinge on these proteins and modify them post-translationally. In the end, what a gatekeeper will do if a cell seems to be on the verge of converting into a neoplastic phenotype, it will give that cell two options, either die by apoptosis, and clear why that works, a dead cell cannot form a tumor, or undergo senescence, and that works because senescent cells arrest growth, they never divide again, and therefore they also cannot form a tumor. So the gatekeepers then determine the fate of a potential cancer cell, and it tells it either die or undergo senescence. And by the way, we still are not 100% sure of how that decision is made. Be that as it may, think now about a tissue that's 50 to 60 years of age, and it's been experiencing cell loss or arrest of cell division as an attempt to prevent cancer. Over the time, these tissues will experience degeneration and atrophy. I'll also show you that senescence is much more complicated and it will even begin to change the landscape of the tissue around the senescent cell. These two phenotypes are exactly what we call aging. And just as, as Mel pointed out, this was first predicted in the 1950s by um, a very famous evolutionary biologist, George Williams, and he called this process antagonistic pleiotropy. And what that means in simple terms is what is good for you when you're young can be bad for you when you're old. And so the challenge for those of us who are trying to fight aging is to understand this balance and make sure that the balance is maintained and that we retain the good parts while alleviating the bad parts. And that it's not so simple, but I'll show you some hope that we're on the cusp of maybe understanding how to do that. <clears throat> okay, so what is cellular senescence? The simple way to understand it is that it's what we call a tripartite phenotype. That is, it's a, um, a cell takes on three major phenotypes. It stops dividing. This is essentially irreversible. I, I don't want to be dogmatic about it. There may be on rare occasions when cells can escape from this growth arrest, but for the most part, it's a very tight growth arrest. 
it obviously stops cancer. Um, in addition, the cells become resistant to undergoing cell death. Um, I'll come back to this point in a moment, but most important, the cells begin now to develop a very complicated secretory phenotype because it needs to net let its neighboring cells know something is amiss, something has happened to me and you guys around me, <clears throat> you need to be on the lookout. So what we now know is that there are many types of um, insults that will drive a cell into this phenotype and some of them are very uh, expected. So these are things that will either drive aging or cancer. So things, for example, that damage the genome or even the epigenome, many oncogenes will drive cells into a senescent uh, state. But even things that derange uh, metabolism, for example, advanced glycation end products or organelle stress like ER stress, <clears throat> all of these things are stressors that are associated with either aging or cancer. And as a consequence, cells will enter this state. But there's something that is often overlooked and it's really important to remember. And that is because this phenotype was under evolutionary pressure, it had to have beneficial effects. And aside from tumor suppression, which is the obvious beneficial effect, things like the secretory phenotype also evolved to promote young life. So for example, there are certain structures in the embryo, this is true of both mice and humans, that are initiated by a wave of secretions from senescent cells that help optimize the, the, um, uh, the structure, the morphogenesis of that structure. Um, parturition, labor, is, in, is induced by a wave of senescence in the placenta. And we now know that many forms of tissue repair and wound healing uh, require signals from the secretory phenotype in order to initiate. So the way we really have to think about senescence now is that it's an evolutionary balancing act. It really evolved for some very good purposes for keeping young organisms healthy and fit, but in the end, uh, it can drive phenotypes that we associate with degeneration and aging. And our challenge is to maintain the good and try to eliminate the deleterious. So let me say one word about uh, senescent cells themselves. Um, over the years, many, many labs have studied senescence and many of us have identified biomarkers by which we can go into tissue, human and mice, and ask when and where do senescent cells appear. And I've listed here just a partial list of some of these um, biomarkers. Uh, some of them are proteins that can be identified based on their localization. For example, HMGB1 is normally in the nucleus and senescent cells, it leaves the nucleus and is secreted where it was the founding member of a family of proteins that are now called DAMPs, damage associated molecular patterns. Um, <clears throat> there is the expression of two very powerful tumor suppressor genes that are also cell cycle inhibitors. They help install this growth arrest, P16, P21. Um, and there are lots and lots of other things that are secreted, um, chemokines, growth factors, proteases, and we now know a large number of bioactive lipids. Um, the problem is none of these markers, none of them are absolutely senescent specific. And this is something that we just have to live with in the field. So every one of these markers has a life outside of senescence. So many people now have taken a cluster of these markers to try to ask the question, when and where do senescent cells appear in vivo? <clears throat> and the answer is twofold. The first is they absolutely increase with age. This is human skin, and this is one of these markers. This is young skin. This is old skin, this is the dermis, this is the epidermis, and they're just more senescent cells in, in the old skin. But it's true for virtually every vertebrate species that has been examined from humans to zebrafish. And it is true for virtually every tissue that has been examined, including the brain. 
the other place we see them is that they're more prevalent at sites of those age-related diseases that I showed you on my first slide <clears throat> and um, compared say to age-matched healthy tissue. So for example, um, this, is, this is obviously autopsy material. This is brain from a patient with Alzheimer's disease. There are senescent cells in this brain. The senescent cells are astrocytes. And I will remind you, astrocytes are the major cell type that gives rise to brain cancer. But if you compare this brain to a brain of an age match but cognitively normal person, um, there are far, far more senescent cells in the age brain, in the Alzheimer's brain, compared to the age match brain. All this being said, a very important point is that senescent cells are never abundant, ever. There, there are most reports show a few percent of senescent cells at the most, even in the oldest tissue and the most diseased tissue. So this now begs a really important question. If senescent cells are important as a driver of very different age-related pathologies, how could this happen when there are so few cells? And we think we understand the answer to this. So the question then is, how on earth could senescent cells be driving these different diseases when there's only a few percent of them present, even in the oldest and most diseased tissue? And then the second question is, do they do it? So the common um, uh, term is that senescent cells are a smoking gun. That is, they're present at the right time and the right place to be driving aging. But how do they do it? And of course, do they do it? Because everything I've told you so far is correlation. And we all know correlation does not prove causality. So let me start <clears throat> with how, because I think we understand this pretty well. And then I'll show you data to suggest that they do at least in the mouse. Of course, we're still struggling to prove this in humans. So this is how. We really think it has to do with what the cells are secreting. And we, we tend to divide their secretion into two main um, mechanisms. One depends on the P53 tumor suppressor. So this is the classic gatekeeper tumor suppressor gene. Um, it does not necessarily require changes in transcription. So lots of new transcriptome methods don't pick this up. But what happens is senescent cells begin to secrete these molecules called damage associated molecular patterns. And these are known to be danger signals to, um, to the organism that helps them fight off an impending pathogen. The other, does not depend on this tumor suppressor gene, P53, often requires new transcription. And it then causes the transcription, translation, and secretion of many cytokines, chemokines, many growth factors, proteases. And recently, we have a paper now in press showing many bioactive lipids like icosanoids and leukotrienes. So what do these two things have in common? They all drive inflammation. And you probably know that many years ago, Claudio Franceschi coined the term inflammation. And his hypothesis, and I think this has been proven now to be true, is that <clears throat> you can always identify young from old tissue by looking for signs of low level chronic inflammation. And we know from many pathological studies that chronic inflammation will eventually destroy tissues because much of that infl inflammation, uh, inflammation infiltration is due to the innate immune system, which is designed to kill pathogens non-specifically. So it means they're secreting hydrogen peroxide, chloride, toxic molecules that will eventually destroy a tissue. 
many of the um, of the secretions of innate immune cells will destroy normal tissue function, will prevent stem cells from functioning, and of course, greatly increases the susceptibility to cancer. But I also want to remind you that you will never heal a wound or repair a tissue if you don't have at least an initial transient inflammatory response. So inflammation when it's chronic is bad, but it is absolutely essential for tissue repair. And I also want to point out, we call this inflammation plus because although many of these secretions are indeed pro-inflammatory, some of them are not. Some of them are things like, for example, growth factors that help uh, promote tissue repair. So it's more than just simple inflammation. And this is what senescent cells are doing. I will remind you also that if you have one senescent cell, the secretions can now have a field effect and can affect many more tissues outside of that cell. So I'm gonna give you just two pieces of data to, to illustrate uh, this point. Um, this is an example of, again, a three-dimensional culture of human breast cells growing in 3D. Now the red is actually beta casein. So if we add lactogenic hormones to these cultures, the cells produce milk. And you can see that they form these beautiful alveoli. They're producing lots of milk. We embed in these cultures non-senescent breast fibroblasts, and we get, again, lovely alveoli, lots of milk. If the breast fibroblasts are senescent, you can see the alveoli are misshapen milk production falls. And this work was done by Simona Paranello and she was in my lab and she showed a lot of this transition is due to the proteases that the senescent cells produce. Here's another example, first started by Anna Kratolica in the lab. You're looking at tumor size over time of a pre-malignant breast epithelial cell. So these cells are not normal, but they don't form tumors. But if you co-inject them with senescent breast fibroblasts, these cells convert to full-blown tumor genicity. And this is in an immune competent mouse. We can take human breast cancer cells and put them into an immune incompetent mouse. And after six weeks, this is what the tumor looks like. But if we co-inject with breast fibroblasts that are senescent, the tumors are larger. They're also more vascularized. Senescent cells produce a lot of VEGF, and these tumors metastasize, and these do not. So the idea is, is that at least in these co-culture models, we can show that senescent cells produce molecules that can drive phenotypes we associate with malignancy. Now, I think the best examples, though, come from the mouse models, and there are two. One of them uh, we made, it's called the P16 3MR mouse. The other is called the Ink Attack mouse, and it was made by our colleagues at the Mayo Clinic. But they're based on the same principle. What they do is they take a portion of the P16 promoter. So I told you many senescent cells express the P16 tumor suppressor. This is a cell cycle inhibitor. Um, a disadvantage of this mouse and the Incatac mouse is that not all senescent cells arrest due to P16. So it only allows us to manipulate P16 positive senescent cells. Nonetheless, what we did is we took a large bacterial artificial chromosome, engineered it so that the P16 promoter was driving this artificial gene which is a fusion protein between a luciferase, so we can image senescent cells in vivo, a red fluorescent protein, so we can sort the cells from tissue, and then, of course, this herpes simplex virus, thymidine kinase, which has a very high affinity for this prodrug, gancyclovir. When it's phosphorylated by the viral thymidine kinase, this molecule is a DNA chain terminator, of course, senescent cells don't replicate nuclear DNA, but this gets into the mitochondria, fragments the mitochondrial genome, and the cells die by apoptosis. 
So we can eliminate senescent cells at any point in the lifespan by feeding the animals gancyclovir. And I should point out, we don't need high doses of gancyclovir or long periods of time. This is short intermittent dosing. So I'll just give you one example. This is this, I should point out this mouse was made in collaboration with Jan Grimacher's lab at Erasmus University and Jan Vich's lab at Einstein University. And most of the work was done by Marco Di Maria, who now has his own lab in Groningen. Um, so here's an example. Here's whole body luminescence of a mouse, 12 months of age. So that's 30, 35 years of age. Everybody in the audience over 35, you have to start to worry because look what happens over time. <laughs> the luminescence just goes up. Notice also the error bars get larger and larger. And this is not because Marco was getting sloppy. This is a classic feature of aging is this stochastic variation that we don't completely understand. Nonetheless, we can take a mouse with a pretty high burden of senescent cells, treat it with gancyclovir in this case for five days and eliminate about 80, 70 to 80% 80 of, the, of the signal. This is a, a different marker. This is visceral fat. Visceral fat is very rich in senescent cells. And this is this um, SA beta gal marker. And again, if we treat the animals with gancyclovir, we eliminate about 70 to 80% of, of the signal. So the mouse seems to be working the way it should. And now what we've done is we have shared our mice with literally dozens, dozens of laboratories all over the world, each of them working on a different age-related disease. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to first show you a tiny bit of data, of our own data, using this mouse. We're very interested in the, um, in the effects of how we treat cancer, which is these genotoxic chemotherapies. And, and just incidentally, the same story is true for now many of the drugs we're using to treat patients with HIV AIDS, but I'm just gonna show you the chemotherapy story. So I will remind you, there are lots of genotoxic chemotherapies that, that work. There are children who would be dead from leukemia or lymphoma if it weren't for these drugs. So you give the kids these drugs, it cures their tumors. They have another 20 years of life. What happens though, is that many years later, they are developing um, premature aging in multiple tissues. And so what Marco did was he gave our mice a single dose of these different chemotherapies. The mice then developed a lifelong burden of senescent cells. And now he asks, what's the cost? And the cost is really interesting. So first he asked about cancer. So he took a breast cancer cell line, now expressing a different luciferase. So we're gonna follow the tumor with a different luciferase. He injects these cells into the mammary fat pad, and it's known that these cells metastasize to the lung and the liver. So here's the experiment. We give the animals breast cancer, we let the tumor grow a little bit. We give them the chemotherapy, in this case, doxorubicin, it causes DNA damage and mitochondrial damage. Very shortly after, we give the animals gancyclovir or not. And then a few weeks later, we image them. So here's, the, here's a control animal, primary tumor, metastasis to the liver and the lung. Here are the treated animals. So first of all, notice there's variable effects on the primary tumor. We don't completely understand this, but for sure, some of these tumors are already being uh, ameliorated by the presence of gancyclovir, although some are not. But in all cases, we've eliminated metastasis. And our hypothesis is that senescent cells are secreting molecules that change the systemic milieu that makes it in um, advisable for these metastatic cells to either um, establish or to proliferate. The other problem with these genotoxic chemotherapies is they cause heart problems. In fact, that limits how much, how much um, uh, an oncologist can administer to a patient. So you get a declining ejection fraction and fractional shortening. 
But if shortly after we add the chemotherapy, we now give the animals gancyclovir, we can pr completely prevent that loss of heart function. And the other problem is blood clotting. Patients often will suffer from blood clots. And again, doxorubicin causes blood clotting as shortened tail bleeding time or low, lower hemoglobin content uh, if you leak it into some PBS. And again, gancyclovir completely prevents that. Uh, I, and my impassioned plea now to all oncologists is to think about ways to eliminate senescent cells after administering these genotoxic chemotherapies to avoid some of the side effects that appear years down the road. I just want to show you one more piece of data of a very different type of disease, Parkinson's disease. So this is a neurodegenerative disease. It's called by loss of neurons in the substantia nigra. And it can be caused by a herbicide called Paraquat, which induces severe oxidative stress. It was used as an herbicide for many years and, and humans who were working in the field develop Parkinsonian symptoms. And we can mimic that in the mouse. And when we did this, this was a collaboration with Julie Anderson's lab. Um, we could show that paraquat caused astrocytes to undergo senescence. So here's the experiment. This is a rearing assay, and it requires some motor neuron function on the part of the mouse. After paraquat treatment, the animals just lose that ability. They can't do it. But if after the paraquat, we treat with gancyclovir, we can prevent that loss of motor neuron function. And so what this argues is that clearing senescent cells can have multiple benefits uh, in surprising ways. And so now this is where I was going before I forgot what I was gonna show you is We've shared our mice with dozens upon dozens of laboratories, each working on a different age-related disease. And I've stopped trying to update this table because almost every few weeks, there's a new disease that we can show or others can show by eliminating senescent cells, it is possible to either prevent or ameliorate or in a few cases, for example, in the case of osteoarthritis, even reverse some of the phenotypes that we associate with aging. So this is great news. This is the model with, with age, we're accumulating senescent cells, they're secreting things, they cause neighboring cells to dysfunction. I told you earlier on, we're all accumulating premalignant cells, and we would argue that senescent cells can even then drive the development of late life cancer. And so this is the model that we're continuing to work on. Now, this is also, if you think about it, a little bit depressing. If you don't have senescent cells, you're gonna have a hard time healing a wound. And if you do have senescent cells, you're gonna have a hard time avoiding these diseases. So what do we do? What we'd like to do is to be able to do what our transgene can do. Can we take humans and get rid of senescent cells at will? That is at any point in the lifespan, not during embryogenesis, not during pregnancy, but say in an adult. Okay, so we can't make transgenic humans, um, at least not yet. Well, actually probably there are some countries that are, but we don't talk about them, um, but can we develop drugs that can do what our transgenes can do? And as now it sort of alluded to, there are drugs. There are actually two classes of drugs now that are receiving a lot of attention. The first class is called senolytics. These are drugs that are designed to selectively kill senescent cells. Many senescent cells have a mild upregulation of anti-apoptotic proteins like the BCL2 family members. And many senolytics target those proteins and can flip the balance so that now senescent cells will die. The other class are called senomorphics. These do not kill senescent cells, but what they can do is they can selectively suppress 
certain aspects of the secretory phenotype, including some of the pro-inflammatory phenotypes. So these are exciting. Um, we tend to favor senolytics because we now know from experiments that we and others have done, um, you can treat for a short period of time and relatively low dose. And so you can apply intermittent dosing to uh, apply a senolytic, whereas senomorphics generally require constant pressure from the drug. We're not there yet though. You're not gonna be able to go to your local drugstore and ask for a senolytic or a senomorphic because there's still big, big unanswered questions. So first of all, there are no known drugs that work against all senescent cells. I'll show you senescent cells are very uh, heterogeneous. Um, and so we have to tailor these drugs to be able to be more specific. Secondly, as I told you, some are beneficial and we definitely don't want to get rid of the good guys. And then I'll also show you just how plastic and heterogeneous the SASP is. So here's one example. Uh, this is an old experiment that was done by Jean-Philippe Coppe when he was in the lab. This is an antibody array. And what he did is he took human fibroblasts and epithelial cells from the same tissue and the same person. So the genotype is the same, the tissue is the same. And he separated the stroma from the epithelium. He made them all senescent by ionizing radiation. And then he asked, what are they secreting? So you can see there are things in common, but there are things that are stromal specific and things that are epithelial specific. And we've now looked at dozens of different human and mouse cell types and this is pretty much what you see is that there are cell type specific differences. Again, with RNA-seq, we compared, for example, astrocytes with fibroblasts. There's overlap, but there's about 50% distinction between an astrocyte and a human fibroblast. And if we compare human to mouse, there's again, species specific differences. The SASP is also dynamic. It doesn't stay the same. So here is an example of human lung fibroblasts we've induced to senesce by ionizing radiation. And you can see initially there's a huge increase in the expression of this gene, ALOX5, which codes for a pro-fibrotic leukotriene. So initially it's a huge induction, induction declines, there's a second wave and eventually it comes down to baseline very different from the time course of this antifibrotic prostaglandin, where you can see it takes a long time and eventually this prostaglandin begins to rise. Now we've also looked at lung fibroblasts from patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And it's interesting, those mutant fibroblasts are perfectly capable of a normal ALOX5 response but they're defective in inducing high levels of this antifibrotic prostaglandin. And so we suspect in at least some of these patients, the problem lies in being to, able to induce the antifibrotic wave of the SASP. We do not know how senescent cells become senescent in vivo during aging. So I've listed here four ways that we know cells become senescent. Um, and then we looked at their secretory phenotype and binned them into major groups and then color coded those groups. And the bottom line is that there are certain inducers that acquire certain phenotypes of the SAS that are not present with other inducers. And so again, there's a lot of plasticity and we're actually hoping these signatures will help us understand why cells become senescent in vivo. And then finally, I'll just bring your attention um, to this publication last year in which we did unbiased proteomics of both the soluble proteins and proteins present in exosomes induced by different inducers. These were all in human lung fibroblasts. And we've shown that there are things that are distinct for each inducer, but there's also a core 
of proteins that seem to be present regardless of the inducer. And in collaboration with Luigi Ferrucci, we've been able to show that a large number of these core proteins also increase with age in human plasma. And all of this is published. And actually, there's an open website. If you go to the Buck website and look for the SASP Atlas, we keep on adding data. So if you have a favorite protein, you can see um, what we've learned about that protein from that website. So I just want to end again by reminding you about why the SASP evolved, and that's for wound healing. So here's again our transgenic mice. We make a little punch biopsy on the dorsal flank. There's a wave of senescence, and then it declines. That's kind of important. These are female mice. Male mice have a different wound healing uh, time course, but the results are the same. We can block this wave with gansliglivir. And when we do that, we can ask what happens to wound healing. So here are the senescent, here are the animals that develop senescence, and here are the senescent free wounds. And you can see wound healing is retarded, and these wounds are also more fibrotic than these wounds. And what we've been able to show is that we, when we uh, um, isolate senescent cells from these wounds, we can show that they're secreting um, an understudied isoform of platelet-derived growth factor called PDGF-AA. And this isoform is secreted at high levels by senescent cells. And if we topically apply PDGF-AA to these wounds, we can completely reverse that slow wound healing phenotype. And I should also point out that the cells that are producing PDGF-AA and are senescent are mostly fibroblasts and endothelial cells. So let me go back to this. Okay, this is great. Senescent cells promote wound healing. I showed you senescent cells accumulate with age in the skin. And everybody knows wound healing does not get better with age. So how do we reconcile these data? This is the last piece of data I'll show you. Um, this is another transgenic mouse in which we have um, engineered Cre activated by tamoxifen to excise this SOD2 gene, which causes severe oxidative stress, but only in the skin, driven by a skin specific promoter. And when we do this, we get senescence in the skin. Now we can ask what happens to wound healing in the skin. And again, wound healing is retarded. So the idea is, is that um, what evolution selected for is the transient presence of senescent cells, and that helps wound healing. But when the cells become persistent, which they do with age, and we can discuss maybe why that might be the case, um, then they become maladaptive. And that's when the phenotypes we associate with aging begin to accumulate. So these drugs, senolytics, they're not optimized. There were some very early human trials, very early. They're on the horizon. I think in our lifetime, they will be available. Um, are we gonna live longer? So let me show you that this experiment has been done by Jan van Dersen at the Mayo Clinic using his mouse, his Incapath mouse. So here are two strains of mice. Middle life, he began treating them with the senolytic. And what happened is he got this impressive increase in median lifespan and no increase in maximum lifespan. So put another way, these mice died healthier. Now, some people will argue, well, okay, something else is killing these animals. We need to know what it is. And once we fix that problem, we'll now be able to get mice to live longer. I, I'm really not optimistic if you think about the history of lifespan expansion. So the world's record for extending lifespan in any organism is in C. elegans, a simple organism, and the record is tenfold. But if you take an animal that is a little bit more complicated, Drosophila, for example, 
the world record is less than twofold. And if you go to a mouse, well, actually 20% probably has not yet been repeated, but most of the increases are in the five to 10% range. So I think what this is telling us is one of the big mysteries in aging research is we do not know how species specific lifespans are set by evolution. Um, it's still a big mystery. And until we understand that, I think what we can look forward to is something that um, Thurgood Marshall was famous for saying. I, probably very few of you know who Thurgood Marshall is. He was the first black Supreme Court justice elected uh, in the United States appointed, sorry, in the United States. And uh, this was in the 1960s. So of course, uh, it was not a very bright time for racial tolerance, not that it's better now, but it was a little bit worse then. And someone had the nerve to ask him how long he planned to live. And his response was, I plan to live for 110 years and die from a bullet wound from a jealous husband. And so I think maybe this is something we can look forward to, but we probably are not going to live the way Aubrey de Grey would say for 5,000 years. Now, I have to tell you, none of this work would be possible without a fantastic group of people in the lab, wonderful past lab members with whom we still collaborate and a huge number of international collaborators that have made all of this work possible. And I'm happy to take questions um, at any time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. That was a great talk. Many, many things were, uh, were presented. So I'm expecting as many questions. Uh, we have uh, approximately half an hour for discussion. And uh, so now the if anyone has a question, as I said, you raise your, you either raise your hand or uh, send a message in the in the chat. Uh, Martin, I think you're raising your hand, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, my computer just froze, and I don't want to shut it down, so I, I'll just keep it the way it is. I'm sorry about this. Oh, it's okay. Okay. Hello. Yes, Martin. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Bye. So I can go ahead. Yes. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, so in comparing uh, cancer and aging, uh, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, cancer can be con considered as a gain of function uh, disease um, in contrast to aging, um, which you sort of defined or characterized as a loss of function. But I've seen others taking the perspective of cancer uh, being a loss of function, at least with respect to some of the hallmarks, such as uh, the failure to respond to apoptotic signals. So I guess my question is twofold. Um, first, I would like, uh, well, would, would you agree with uh, such construal so that uh, cancer can be also considered as a, a, uh, as a loss function? Uh, and and uh, second, uh, do you think it makes any practical difference uh, different, uh, to adopt uh, one perspective over the other? And if so, what, uh, what these sort of practical implications are? Thank you. Yeah, so it's a very good point and it's, it's a semantic point. So yes, there are people who would argue that cancer is a loss of function because you lose normal functions. Um, my point was that if you accept the idea that there is a loss of function and a gain of function separation, it leads you to the next question, which is how do they overlap and how how can you make sense then of how both of these could be age-related diseases? So however you come at it is fine, as long as we all agree though that cancer is in fact an age-related disease and whether it's loss or gain is, is irrelevant. It was more our logic, the way our logic was construed to get us towards the answer. So fine, if you want to say cancer is also loss of function, that's, that's fair enough. Okay, thank you. So I, for, I forgot maybe to, to ask uh, participants to tell uh, who they are. I mean, very briefly, of course. So for Martin, yes. Martin is a philosopher of, uh, of science. Ah. 
Uh, Andreas, please. So, so I'm here, you hear me? Um, yes. Probably, so, so, so I'm here, professor at University of Boulder, I'm biologist and working on cancer and angiogenesis. So, um, so, so my question is, in fact, what is the principal, uh, uh, principal uh, cell type that, that is undergoing SAS? The endothelium is very exposed to the uh, fluid and the endothelium and blood vessels are, are, are in fact all over. So then the brain is, so they're everything. So, so maybe one idea could be that the blood vessels and the endothelium are in fact one of the principal targets of SASP. So what's your idea about that? So we agree. So I, I will tell you, we have a whole program now, or two, well, we have two students now uh, working on characterizing uh, endothelial cell senescence and the endothelial SASP, but also, as you said, the response of endothelial cells yes. to this, let's say, stromal cells. Um, what I can tell you, and this did surprise us, is the two types of endothelial cells we're exploring are uh, endothelial cells from the capillaries of the lung and endothelial cells from the major femoral artery. Mm -hmm. So they're very different types of endothelium. And, you know, to our chagrin, they not only don't grow under the same circumstances. So I should tell you, many years ago, we realized that mouse cells are hypersensitive to 20% oxygen. So we grow all of our cells in 3 to 5% oxygen, which is on average what is seen in vivo. But lung endothelial capillaries grow optimally at 14% oxygen. So, you know, everybody's complaining because we have, you know, incubators of 3%, 5%, 14%, 12%, et cetera. So they grow very differently from the major artery endothelial cells. And their SAS are different. There is some overlap. They do overlap, but their SAS are different. The other thing we've noticed is that if we take a SAS, say, from a stromal cell, say, from the a stromal fraction, and put that SASP on a capillary endothelial cell, mm -hmm. those cells are more inclined to die than from endothelial cells from a major artery. So their susceptibility to dying is also different. So, you know, I, I think what we're learning is what all of biology is learning. A cell is not a cell and generalizing even endothelial cell to endothelial cell is, is, is different. We also think that the, the response of the endothelium is got to be a major dictator of what happens elsewhere in the body, especially things that happen in the brain. Because as you know, you know there is this blood brain barrier and it's those endothelial cells that are the, the gatekeepers of what gets into the brain and what doesn't. So we're beginning to study that in series two, but we don't have any really good molecular insights at the moment. Um, but just maybe one small uh, to finish. So there has been a work by Walsh at all on the clonal hemopoiesis. So, uh, so what is the relationship of the clonal hemopoiesis to the SARS phenotype? Uh, we're not sure about the SASP, but what we're a little bit sure about is proximity to senescent cells. So just to remind you, senescent cells also have self-surface markers and can have direct cell-cell interactions with neighboring cells. So what we know is that the stroma, the bone marrow stroma, changes with age and does accumulate senescent stromal cells. Mm. And those senescent stromal cells have different affinities for different hematopoietic stem cells. Mm -hmm. And if you know the work of James de Gregori, I, I don't know if you know that, you must know because you're in Boulder, right? <laughs> I mean, he's, he's in Denver, but anyway. Um, you know, James's whole idea is that 
the hematopoietic stem cells are acquiring mutations all the time, and many of those mutations are benign until the stromal microenvironment changes. And then you begin to get selection for certain clonal outgrowths. And right. so it's a combination of mutation and the aged environment. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. So next in line, uh, Victor Ape is asking a question in the chat. I will read the question. It's a series of question, related question. Victor is, uh, is uh, an immunologist. A biologist is working in, in the same lab as I do and is, in, is working on uh, immunosenescence uh, generally to, to make it very short. Uh, so he says, thank you, thank you for this beautiful talk. Do you think that the, the decline of anti-tumor immunosurveillance uh, due to uh, immune aging and immunosenescence plays a role in increased cancer pre prevalence with old age? And if yes, what would you think is its weight or importance uh, as compared to other factors like mutations, senescent cells, SASP, etc.? And he has also a second question, which is, could senescent cell, cells be naturally removed by our adaptive immunity? So those are both great questions. Um, uh, how, how shall I start? So let me start by saying it's definitely true that um, the innate immune system can and does recognize senescent cells. So we showed many years ago that a subpopulation of senescent cells express ligands for natural killer cells. And natural killer cells will then their receptors will then recognize a senescent cell, um, shoot in a little granzyme and kill that target cell. What happens over time though, is that senescent cells also produce a number of proteases. And the proteases do two things. They cleave the receptors for natural killer cells from the surface of the senescent cell. So now you have decoy ligands floating around. They can also cleave the receptors from the natural killer cells, which is even worse because now you have natural killer cells that have no uh, receptors. So even if the decoy receptors were to bind, uh, the decoy ligands were to bind a receptor on the natural killer cell, that natural killer cell would be rendered ineffective. Now, we, we still don't completely understand this because if we take pure, relatively pure natural killer cells and put them on senescent cells, we get killing of maybe 80, sometimes 85% of the cell. We don't know what makes a cell resistant and we don't know yet how to kill those resistant cells. And we have a hypothesis that we're testing now that it might be neutrophils because one of the things when we isolate natural killer cells is we're leaving the neutrophils behind. And so we're, test, we're trying to attempt to test that now. As far as the adaptive immune system goes, um, there are cell surface receptors that are expressed by senescent cells that could be identified by the adaptive immune system. And Scott Lowe recently had a paper uh, showing that this is possible. Um, we think there are more and we're now doing what we call the surfaceome of senescent cells. But again, the complication is we're doing it in fibroblasts because they're easy to grow and to start with but the surface some of different cell types is going to be different for sure. So then the question is why do they accumulate with age? The adaptive immune system declines with age. I think we all agree with that. It's not clear what happens, at least it's not clear to me as a non-immunologist, what happens to the innate immune system with age. Some people say it declines, others say it becomes hyperactive and others say it just becomes different. And maybe all three are the same. The main point is senescent cells do increase in number with age and we're not sure why, but for sure harnessing the immune system to do a better job 
is, is a terrific idea. And I know we're working on it and several other labs are also working on it. Thank you very much. So next question, Simon. Hi, my name is Simon. I'm a philosopher as well, also at the University of Bordeaux. Um, I have a question about antagonistic theotropy. So basically, the, to put it crudely, the idea that good stuff happens early in life while bad stuff happens late in life. Right. Um, but I was wondering um, whether your, we couldn't say that that the reverse is also the case. So the, that cellular senescence can prevent cancer early in life, but could it not also prevent cancer late in life? And could the good stuff or the bad stuff that happens, namely the promotion of cancer, also happen early in life? Do you get my point? I mean, uh, is it? Yes. Yeah, yes, okay. I do. I do. So, so you're absolutely right. Um, so first of all, young people do get cancer. It's quite rare. Yeah, sure thing. They do get. I will say there is scant to no evidence that those early life cancers are driven by any form of senescence. However, mm. we have taken, um, for example, glioblastoma from a young, youngish patient, patient, meaning. This was a patient in their mid twenties to early thirties. So not a child, but, and we have been able to show that if we take the SASP of normal astrocytes and put it on those glioblastoma cells, they do get worse. Oh, so okay. it is, yeah, so it is possible that it could be the confluence of two bad things happening at once, the mutation that make glioblastoma happen, and then something that drives senescence of an astrocyte nearby that could then exacerbate the growth of that tumor. We don't think that could happen very often, but it, it certainly could happen. It, it's certainly within the realm of possibility. Okay. And would you then, cons if this were the case, would you then consider this as an counter argument or Counter example to the antagonistic preotopy, or would you still say uh, the cellular senescence is consistent with this idea? Oh um, no, I, I, you know, I think every um, every major theory, especially every major evolutionary theory, it, it, mm -hmm. is based on probability, right? Yeah. And so you have a Gaussian curve, and there's always the edges of the Gaussian curve, and it doesn't mean that the peak of the curve is, is incorrect. I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'd like to follow up maybe uh, with uh, a question, but um, uh, Judy, you might not know the answer because it's uh, it's a bit um, uh, at the margin of, of the talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, SASP in evolution. You, men you mentioned actually vertebrates. Uh, what about earlier uh, in evolution? I mean, this is, for me, the picture is quite blurry to what happened earlier. Uh, in uh, by 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 lateria, for instance, or 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 even uh, earlier than that, do you have any? Yeah. Indication? Well, I can tell you some personal experience. Maybe I don't know, eight or nine or ten years ago, Cynthia Kenyon um, contacted me and said, you know, let's look for senescence in C. elegans, and. And, and so at the time we didn't have quite as many markers, but we had half a dozen markers. And frankly, we never found any evidence for senescence in C. elegans. Um, and she was disappointed, I was disappointed. You know, if we had L C. elegans, we could do genetic experiments every two weeks, you know, and mice and humans are horrible. Then about um, Five years ago, Pankaj Kapahi, who works on Drosophila, said, I think there's going to be senescence in Drosophila. And so I told him about C. elegans. He said, there's a difference. In Drosophila, the gut undergoes a hyperplastic, age-related hyperplasia that looks a lot like early gut cancer. 
Um, it doesn't metastasize the way mammalian cancers do, but it's definitely hyperplastic. And so we began to look for senescence markers in the Drosophila gut, and we have begun to find them. And so it could be that it may be only those tissues where um, there is a danger of hyperplasia that the senescent phenotype might cut in. And so I think he's going to have a paper soon um, suggesting that there are in fact uh, senescent markers, we can say senescent markers in a certain subpopulation of cells in the gut with age in Drosophila. That being said, about three years ago, I was at a meeting in Hong Kong and um, uh, Carl Harrop, who is a neurobiologist, he, he has since left Hong Kong, so he's safe. He's, well, I don't know if he's safe, but he, he's in Philadelphia, so, or Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. Um, anyway, he got me aside and he said, I think aging neurons undergo senescence. And I was like, Carl, you know, neurons don't divide. They don't need to undergo senescence. And he said, it's true. They don't need to stop dividing, but they need to keep their secretory phenotype under control because once a neuron starts secreting, it screws up its neighboring neurons and blah, blah, blah. And I spent probably an hour going through his data. And I must say, he changed my mind. And since that time, we have now begun to look at certain neurons under certain stresses. And they do seem to develop, um, first of all, they resist dying. So as you know, neurons do die. But certain neurons, they're stubborn. They don't die. And in fact, it may be better if they did die. And secondly, they start secreting some of the classic pro-inflammatory cytokines we associate with stromal cells. So in right now, the whole field of senescence is kind of changing its morphology and it's becoming more complicated, but it's also saying that we shouldn't have religion. We shouldn't interject religion into our science. There are no hard and fast rules. Cells are behaving in ways that they have been programmed to, and sometimes the program is pro-adaptive and sometimes it's maladaptive. And it's our job to try to figure out how to tweak them to become more adaptive as opposed to maladaptive. And that, that's the biggest challenge we face now as biologists, I think. Okay, thank you very much. There's an, an, another follow-up question, I'd say, by Jean-François Moreau. Jean-François Moreau is, a, is, a, is an immunologist, sorry, professor of immunology at the University of Bordeaux, and he's asking what we know about uh, SASP in uh, the naked mole rat. Oh, yeah. Um, not very much. The, 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 the person who has done the most work on this is Vera Gorbanova. She's at the University of Rochester. She has looked at senescence in the naked mole rat. And she is looking at aging in the naked mole rat. She hasn't really characterized the SAS the way we have. Um, we keep on talking about um, uh, collaborating and it's just, it's, it's just never happened for, for, for logistic reasons for no other reason at some point we'll do it but what we do know is that naked mole rat cells do undergo senescence but they also seem to um, be protected by virtue of this extracellular matrix that they secrete this this hyaluronic acid and that hyaluronic acid also has a very high affinity for secreted factors so one hypothesis based on no data is that their SASP may be less penetrant because they're able to trap factors in the extracellular matrix and it doesn't really enter the system or, or impinge on other tissues the way say a mouse SASP might. But you know, again, early days, but it would be interesting to contact you. You might even want to have Vera because Vera also is very interested in comparative biology. So she's compared, you know, different species and how they undergo aging and 
different age-related processes. So, she, and she's a very good speaker. Well, actually, we've had uh, we've had a talk not by Vera but by her uh, colleague uh, from the same lab. Oh, the, his name doesn't ah. come back to me. Uh, so, sorry, but we've we've had one, uh, and I'm sure ah. Jean Francois will, will like the answer actually. Uh, so yeah, maybe you. Uh, it's Sergey, I think. I don't remember his first name. Uh, Goluanov. Uh, it's, his first name is Sergey, I guess. I'm not sure. Um, I don't. Ah. I don't remember his first name. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I had also maybe an, another question. Uh, oh yes, that's Andre. Thank you, thank you, uh, Thomas. It's And Andre Andre Seluanov. Sorry, I remember ah. Seluanov, but it's not his first name. Um, Seluanov. Yes. So that's that's your question, by the way. Okay. And uh, <laughs> so, oh yeah, oh, one more question by Jean Francois. I think it's a follow up question. To what threshold? Uh, of uh, of SASP uh, positive cells, it um, so uh, Jean Francois, I don't I don't get your question actually. Uh, maybe if you could rephrase it. He's asking a question about the threshold of SASP. Uh, you mean what threshold of SASP positive cells uh, matters in a tissue, right? I guess. I think it's the question. Yes, it's the question. Yeah. I, I can answer in a couple of ways. Um, we have done the following experiment. We've taken a, a um, relatively benign tumor. So it's a tumor, but it's not a very aggressive tumor. And then we've taken fibroblasts from the same tissue, made them senescent, then took the condition medium and put it on that tumor. And that tumor now grows better and invades, blah, blah, blah. But then we titrated down the condition medium and asked how low can we go before we stop seeing these pro-tumorigenic phenotypes and the answer was about 10 percent so if we if we diluted this condition medium by 90 percent we still got malignant phenotypes if we did more than like if we said say 95 percent then the tumor seemed to be normal now we don't know what those factors are, but we're fractionating now and trying to figure that out. So that's one answer. The other question is how many senescent cells do you need in a tissue before you have loss of function of that tissue? And I can tell you right now, we don't know in vivo because the numbers are all over the place. That is, we, for example, we biopsied muscle. We biopsied healthy muscle muscle from exercised people, muscle from sarcopenic people. We've quantified the amount of senescent cells. They're all over the place. But we haven't characterized those senescent cells. In other words, we don't know whether they're the satellite cells or the FAPs or the stromal cells. So instead, what we're doing now is we're building human myobundles in which we can now very precisely add, you know, 1% senescent satellite cells or 2% FAPs or 3% stromal cells. So I hope we'll have that answer soon because the myo bundles are great. You can measure force. You can see how good that muscle is working in, in the myo bundles. Um, and I think that's the only way we're going to get at the answer. And people, by the way, are horrible, horrible uh, subjects for science. We refuse to inbreed, we refuse to control our environment, we don't eat what we should. And so as humans, it's like the error bars are always so large. So we're trying to make it a little bit more precise by building these myobundles. Okay, so we have, so maybe very, very shortly, uh, we have two extra questions by uh, Jean-Francois. Simon, you were also raising your hand. So do you want to, to intervene? So we have just time for one question. So Simon. No, no, my question was already answered. It was about the threshold for a number of senescent cells in order to induce some kind of dysfunction. So, thanks. Okay. Uh, so, Jean-Francois, then, Jean-Francois's question. Uh, so, he asked, do their location in the tissue matters? Oh, that is a great question. I, I mean, I would guess yes. Um, 
but I, but we don't know that. We actually do not know that. That is, if 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 a senescent cell is closer to a blood blood supply, or if it's closer to, say, in the pancreas, closer to a beta cell as opposed to, yeah, very good question. I I don't think we know the answer to that. And uh, he asked a, a last question the, about the lifespan of uh, SAS positive cells. Yeah, um, it's complicated. Um, it depends on what the SAS, what is exactly in the SAS. So I can tell you right now, we just published a paper showing that certain types of DNA damage um, cause senescent cells to produce high levels of TNF alpha. Now, all senescent cells produce a little TNF alpha, but these lesions, which are called transcription blocking lesions, they, they're tenfold higher. Over time, meaning over the course of a few days to weeks, that high level of TNF alpha will kill the senescent cell that's producing it. So self-killing, it will also kill some neighboring cells. So it, not a simple answer. It will, and I wouldn't be surprised if there are other types of senescent cells that can do this with a different time course and using a different factor. So it's not going to be simple. We have a lot to learn. Do I, let, just let me know, Judy, if I pushed things too far, too far uh, by asking two extra questions by Victor and Jean-Francois again. I think it's short it's questions. Okay. Yes. So, thank you very much. So the first one is, does decline of anti-tumor immunosurveillance due to immune aging or immunosenescence play a role in increased cancer prevalence with old age? Oh, I think for sure it does. I think we know this from patients. Patients who are immunocompromised are more prone to cancer. So I think that's for sure. Okay, and the, and the last question, uh, Jean-Francois is also asking whether you think that, or you know that stem cells are sensitive uh, to the consequences of, of SASP or not. Yes, they definitely are. So, you know, we've been able to take neural stem cells and um, muscle stem cells and show that the SAS can inhibit their ability to undergo normal differentiation. Okay, so that's great. That's really very interesting. And I'm impressed uh, by the precision of your questions, of your answers to all these questions. So thank you very much, uh, Judy. So thank you for all the part to all the participants as well. And uh, that's was, that was really great. <laughs> Thank you. This was a delight. It was really a delightful audience. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's that's very nice of you. So um, everyone, I think uh, Toma, if Toma remind, uh, remembers, I guess Toma will remember what our next speaker is, um, and maybe can write it in the chat um, so that we can announce that just before the, the talks end. Um, well, no answer for the moment, so. But thank you again, Judy, and uh, have, an, uh, have a great day. And thank you, everyone. Have a good evening, I suppose, for most of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.